Chapter 3 of The Patchwork Girl of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 3 The Patchwork Girl. Ojo examined this curious contrivance with wonder. The patchwork girl was taller than he when she stood upright, and her body was plump and rounded because it had been so neatly stuffed with cotton. Margalot had first made the girl's form from the patchwork quilt, and then she had dressed it with a patchwork skirt and an apron with pockets in it, using the same gay material throughout. Upon the feet she had sewn a pair of red leather shoes with pointed toes. All the fingers and thumbs of the girl's hands had been carefully formed, and stuffed and stitched at the edges, with gold plates at the ends to serve as fingernails. "'She will have to work when she comes to life,' said Margalot. The head of the patchwork girl was the most curious part of her. While she waited for her husband to finish making his powder of life, the woman had found ample time to complete the head as her fancy dictated, and she realized that a good servant's head must be properly constructed, the hair was of brown yarn and hung down on her neck in several neat braids. Her eyes were two silver suspender buttons, cut from a pair of the magician's old trousers, and they were sewed on with black threads, which formed the pupils of the eyes. Margalot had puzzled over the ears for some time, for these were important if the servant was to hear distinctly, but finally she had made them out of thin plates of gold and attached them in place by means of stitches through tiny holes bored in the metal. Gold is the most common metal in the land of Oz, and is used for many purposes because it is soft and pliable. The woman had cut a slit for the patchwork girl's mouth, and sewn two rows of white pearls in it for teeth, using a strip of scarlet plush for a tongue. This mouth Ojo considered very artistic and lifelike, and Margalot was pleased when the boy praised it. There were almost too many patches on the face of the girl for her to be considered strictly beautiful, for one cheek was yellow and the other red, her chin blue, her forehead purple, and the center, where her nose had been formed and padded, a bright yellow. "'You ought to have had her face all pink,' suggested the boy. "'I suppose so, but I had no pink cloth,' replied the woman. Still, I cannot see as it matters much, for I wish my patchwork girl to be useful, rather than ornamental. If I get tired looking at her patched face, I can whitewash it. Has she any brains? asked Ojo. No, I forgot all about the brains, exclaimed the woman. I'm glad you reminded me of them, for it is not too late to supply them by any means. Until she is brought to life, I can do anything I please with this girl. But I must be careful not to give her too much brains and those she has must be such as are fitted to the station she is to occupy in life. In other words, her brains mustn't be very good. Wrong, said Unc Nunky. No, I'm sure I'm right about that, returned the woman. He means, explained Ojo, that unless your servant has good brains, she won't know how to obey you properly, nor do the things you ask her to do. Well, that may be true, agreed Margalot. But on the contrary, a servant with too much brains is sure to become independent and high and mighty, and feel above her work. This is a very delicate task, as I said, and I must take care to give the girl just the right quantity of the right sort of brains. I want her to know just enough, but not too much." With this she went to another cupboard which was filled with shelves. All the shelves were lined with blue glass bottles, neatly labeled by the magician to show what they contained. One whole shelf was marked Brain Furniture, and the bottles on this shelf were labeled as follows. Obedience, Cleverness, Judgment, Courage, Ingenuity, Amiability, Learning, Truth, Poesy, Self-Reliance. "'Let me see,' said Margalot. "'Of those qualities she must have obedience, first of all.' and she took down the bottle bearing that label, and poured from it upon a dish several grains of the contents. Amiability is also good, and truth. She poured into the dish a quantity from each of these bottles. I think that will do, she continued, for the other qualities are not needed in a servant. Unc Nunky, who with Ojo stood beside her, touched the bottle marked cleverness. Little, 
said he. "'A little cleverness? Well, perhaps you're right, sir,' said she, and was about to take down the bottle when the crooked magician suddenly called to her excitedly from the fireplace. "'Quick, Margalot, come and help me!' She ran to her husband's side at once, and helped him lift the four kettles from the fire. Their contents had all boiled away, leaving in the bottom of each kettle a few grains of fine white powder. Very carefully the magician removed this powder, placing it all together in a golden dish, where he mixed it with a golden spoon. When the mixture was complete there was scarcely a handful all told. That, said Dr. Pipt, in a pleased and triumphant tone, is the wonderful powder of life, which I alone in the world know how to make. It has taken me nearly six years to prepare these precious grains of dust, but the little heap on that dish is worth the price of a kingdom, and many a king would give all he has to possess it. When it has become cooled, I will place it in a small bottle, but meantime I must watch it carefully, lest a gust of wind blow it away or scatter it. Unc Dunky, Margalot, and the magician all stood looking at the marvelous powder, but Ojo was more interested just then in the patchwork girl's brains. Thinking it both unfair and unkind to deprive her of any good qualities that were handy, the boy took down every bottle on the shelf and poured some of the contents in Margalot's dish. No one saw him do this, for all were looking at the powder of life, but soon the woman remembered what she had been doing and came back to the cupboard. "'Let's see,' she remarked. "'I was about to give my girl a little cleverness, "'which is the doctor's substitute for intelligence, "'a quality he has not yet learned how to manufacture.' "'Taking down the bottle of cleverness, "'she added some of the powder to the heap on the dish. "'Ojo became a bit uneasy at this, "'for he had already put quite a lot of the cleverness powder in the dish, "'but he dared not interfere, "'and so he comforted himself with the thought "'that one cannot have too much cleverness.' Margalot now carried the dish of brains to the bench. Ripping the seam of the patch on the girl's forehead, she placed the powder within the head, and then sewed up the seam, as neatly and securely as before. "'My girl is all ready for your powder of life, my dear,' she said to her husband. But the magician replied, "'This powder must not be used before tomorrow morning, but I think it is now cool enough to be bottled.' He selected a small gold bottle, with a pepper-box top, so that the powder might be sprinkled on any object through the small holes. Very carefully he placed the powder of life in the gold bottle, and then locked it up in a drawer of his cabinet. "'At last!' said he, rubbing his hands together gleefully. "'I have ample leisure for a good talk with my old friend Unc Nunky. So let us sit down cozily and enjoy ourselves.' After stirring those four kettles for six years, I'm glad to have a little rest. You will have to do most of the talking, said Ojo, for Unk is called the silent one and uses few words. I know, but that renders your uncle a most agreeable companion and gossip, declared Dr. Pipt. Most people talk too much, so it is a relief to find one who talks too little. Ojo looked at the magician with much awe and curiosity. "'Don't you find it very annoying to be so crooked?' he asked. "'No, I am quite proud of my person,' was the reply. "'I suppose I am the only crooked magician in all the world. "'Some others are accused of being crooked, but I am the only genuine.' "'He was really very crooked, and Ojo wondered how he managed to do so many things with such a twisted body.' When he sat down upon a crooked chair that had been made to fit him, one knee was under his chin, and the other near the small of his back, but he was a cheerful man, and his face bore a pleasant and agreeable expression. "'I am not allowed to perform magic, except for my own amusement,' he told his visitors, as he lighted a pipe, with a crooked stem, and began to smoke. "'Too many people were working magic in the land of Oz, and so our lovely Princess Ozma put a stop to it. I think she was quite right. There were several wicked witches who caused a lot of trouble, but now they are all out of business, and only the great sorceress Glinda the Good is permitted to practice her arts, which never harm anybody. The Wizard of Oz, who used to be a humbug and knew no magic at all, has been taking lessons of Glinda, and I'm told he is getting to be a pretty good wizard, but he is merely the assistant of the great sorceress. Now I have the right to make a servant girl for my wife, you know, or a glass cat to catch our mice, which she refuses to do, but I'm forbidden to work magic for others, or to use it as a profession. Magic must be a very interesting study, said Ojo. 
It truly is, asserted the magician. In my time I have performed some magical feats that were worthy of the skill of Glinda the Good. For instance, there's the powder of life, and my liquid of petrifaction, which is contained in that bottle on the shelf yonder, over the window. What does the liquid of petrifaction do? inquired the boy. Turns everything it touches to solid marble. It's an invention of my own, and I find it very useful. Once, two of those dreadful Kalidars, with bodies like bears and heads like tigers, came here from the forest to attack us, but I sprinkled some of that liquid on them, and instantly they turned to marble. I now use them as ornamental statuary in my garden. This table looks to you like wood, and once it really was wood, but I sprinkled a few drops of the liquid of petrifaction on it, and now it is marble. It will never break, nor wear out. Fine said Unknunky, wagging his head and stroking his long gray beard. "'Dear me, what a chatterbox you're getting to be, Unc!' remarked the magician, who was pleased with the compliment. But just then there came a scratching at the back door, and a shrill voice cried, "'Let me in! Hurry up, can't you? Let me in!' Margolot got up and went to the door. "'Ask like a good cat, then,' she said. "'Meow!' "'There, does that suit your royal highness?' asked the voice, in scornful accents. "'Yes, that's proper cat talk,' declared the woman, and opened the door. At once a cat entered, came to the center of the room, and stopped short at the sight of strangers. Ojo and Unknunky both stared at it with wide open eyes, for surely no such curious creature had ever existed before, even in the land of Oz. End of chapter 3